What is up, guys? Welcome back to the podcast. Hope y'all doing well out there. In this video, we're going to be doing another update on the U.S. versus Maxwell case. Now, this case has been pretty slow for the last month, at least through September. The last significant video I did was back in August, I believe. So it's been pretty slow. Um, we've been focusing more on the uh, uh, Roberts versus Alan Dershowitz and Roberts versus Prince Andrew cases. Those have had a lot of developments. But anyways, last week we got some initial logistical information about the trial uh, against Ghislaine Maxwell that's going to take place. I believe the trial starts on November 29th. Um, the opening arguments start then. So the uh, the judge here is laying down some of the initial groundwork for the logistics of the ch uh, trial, and I'm going to be covering that here uh, since we don't have that much other information. And this is an opportunity for me to explain the jury selection process, which is very important in the American judicial system. So that'll be, uh, you know, interesting information for people who are not familiar with the topic and I always um, enjoy talking about Wardir which I'll explain what that is in a second. So let's get to what the judge had to say here. So Judge Allison is the presiding judge in this case, and this is what she had to say. The court is currently in the process of planning logistics for the trial in this matter and requires the party's best and current estimate of the length of trial. She's asking the defense and the prosecution to estimate how long the trial will last for logistical reasons. The court plans to have the jury sit five days a week from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m., which is pretty regular, um, I think, in most states. In California, uh, when I was in a criminal trial, we sat from 11 a.m., I think, to uh, until 5. So it's, it depends on the state, depends on what kind of trial, um, but that's pretty normal, 9 to 5. G uh, given that the jury selection will be complete by November 19th, an opening statements will occur on November 29. 9. Um, the court requests that the parties provide their best estimates as to when the jury is likely to begin deliberation. Um, and this is important because of uh, because of the vacation that's coming up in December. Um, this will allow the court to assess the likelihood that the trial may continue after Christmas holiday and therefore whether the jury may be required to sit some days during the week between Christmas and New Year's Day. <clears throat> the court usually tries to let people, the jurors, go go out for the holidays. Obviously, they want to, you know, finish business before uh, before the holidays come uh, come around because nobody wants to be in court for Christmas and people try to rush through the judgments and deliberation if it gets late because everybody wants to go back to their families during Christmas. So that's why the scheduling stuff is, uh, it might seem mundane, but it's important. Accordingly, on or before October 12, 2021, the parties are ordered to confer and submit a joint letter with their best and current estimate as to when the jury is likely to begin in deliberation. So deliberations start after both sides are presented their cases. Prosecution presents their side, defense presents their side, and then obviously the jury has to deliberate on who they think made the better case. The both sides have a you know an estimate about how long their presentation is going to take. They're, these are experienced lawyers, so they know how long it's going to take, and that's what the judge is asking for because she wants to set up the schedule in a, in a way that doesn't cut into the holidays, or if it does, she knows beforehand. So this is very like you know, on the ground, logistical stuff, but it's still interesting to me at least. Uh, but in this video, I want to talk about is um, the jury selection process. OK, so she said here, given that jury selection will be complete by November 19th and open arguments will begin 29th. So I want to explain exactly what goes into the jury selection process, also known as voir dire. OK, that's just a Latin fancy name for it. Um, two things, two main things happen during the jury selection process. OK, first, obviously, there's a there's a pool of about 30, uh, 25 to 32 different people that are in the jury pool for uh, potential pickings um, by the prosecution and the defense. So there's a bigger jury pool of people that you can pick from. Usually in California, at least it's 12 people that sit on um, the jury. I think it's the same in New York, 12 people. So out of the 30 or so people, um, the defense and the prosecution gets to ask questions from the people that are likely to be on their jury and ask them and test them on their biases. So um, the defense will try to get the best jury possible in the in the perfect age range that they think and the perfect demographics that they think are going to benefit them. OK, so who are the kinds of people that are likely to be most sympathetic towards Ghislaine Maxwell? That's the question that the defense asks. And then the prosecutors ask the same question. What kind of demographics, what kind of people, what kind of um, ideologies are most likely to be beneficial to their side? Right. So it depends on the defendant. It depends on the kind of trial that's happening. Defense depends on the crime that was committed. 
did. So if uh, if um, women were victimized, as in this case, maybe younger women demographic who are who most likely tend to be progressive and uh, left leaning, those people tend to be bad for people like Ghislaine Maxwell because w- women identify with other women who've been victimized and um, and therefore is are more likely to rule uh, in favor of the prosecution and against the defense. So that's what the defense attorneys are going to be thinking. Then the um, the prosecution is going to be trying to get conservative older men out of the jury as possible because they tend to be more, you know, oh, these women were asking for it. You know, who you know who knows if it was really uh, uh, forced or not. And, you know, these were bloody women. These are the kind of ideas that conservative men tend to think. They tend to, they tend to side with the abuser more than they do with the victim. That's just how it is. Like, you know, you can be offended by that if you like, but that's just that's just statistics from the court. If, for for example, a prostitute was raped, then the uh, older men and women tend to rule against a prostitute and say they were they were that's their job. Their job is having sex for life, uh, sex uh, for their living. So how could they be raped? Or, and older people from the demographic also tend to think stupid things like if you're married to a woman, then you have the right to have sex with her no matter what, even if she says no. It used to be uh, like now it's wrong to rape your wife. But back in the day, I don't know when the exact case was, but back in the back in the day, back in the early even 1900s, it used to be commonplace that um, men can do whatever they want to their wives and the wives have no choice. It, whenever the man wants to have sex, you have to have sex. So these old ideas and these like depending on the demographic you're from, you tend to have certain ideas and those ideas uh, uh, influence the outcome of the trial and the prosecutors and the defense attorneys try to get as many people that are going to be sympathetic to their side on the jury as as possible. OK, that's the whole point of jury selection. I mean, like you might say that's unfair. And w- how could it be just if you're just trying to pick out the people who are best for you? But I don't think it's that unfair because in reality, people have political ideas and there's no such thing as a neutral person. OK, you can be you can be objective, like you can call boss and strikes. That's what I try to do. But I still have my political beliefs, okay? And I talk about them. So everybody has their political beliefs. Everybody has certain ideas that they come come to the table with. And the jury selection process is all about both the defense attorneys and the prosecution trying to get the best people for their side as much as possible. You're never going to get, it's never going to be perfect because you can't dismiss every single juror. You're going to have to pick somebody from the pool. So you try, try to pick the best people that you think are going to be best for your case and are going to give you the outcome you want. Okay. Another part of jury select of the voir dire process is expert selection. So so um, scientific scientific experts, people like psychologists and psychiatrists, which might be relevant to this case, and also other scientific experts that might be relevant, they have to be um, they have to be evaluated by the court. So there's something called the Fry standard, which is or the Fry test, which is sta- uh, which is standardly um, applied to scientific experts and scientific testimony and evidence. The Fry standard is all about the judge hearing arguments about scientific evidence or witnesses that are going to be presented at trial. The Fry standard, uh, the Fry test is administered when one of the parties thinks that the other side's uh, other side's experts are not in line with the larger scientific community. So fringe ideas like flat earthers or people who are anti-vax, these ideas have to be judge, uh, judge through the Fry standard and the Fry test. So a judge has to hear the testimony that's going to be presented or, or a summary of the testimony that's going to be argued by these scientific experts. And the judge determines whether this person's testimony is credible or not. Because if the scientific community says that the earth is round and is not flat and and the defense wants to present an expert that's that's going to testify to the jury that the earth is flat you can't have that because that's first of all it's not true it's a scientific fact that the earth is round and the flat earth uh, expert is wrong because just because you have a medical degree or you have you know some kind of other uh, physics degree or some scientific credential doesn't mean that every single one of your ideas are credible or true or or um, you know agreed to by the rest of the scientific community because science is all about out of consensus. That's why we have peer reviews so that other scientists can review your work and try to confirm your hypotheses and your theories, right? So if other scientists don't agree, that means that there is a significant lapse in your beliefs, like people who believe that vaccines are going to kill people. There's no evidence that's true. Like there's there, there's a, you know, fringe of people in society who believe that and um, then, you know, that's what they believe. They're wrong, but uh, the, the scientific community doesn't agree. So the whole point of the Fry standard during the trial is so that the court doesn't allow unacceptable and, you know, dismissed and undisproven theories to be presented as facts to the jury. The jury has to ha- hear 
accurate evidence in order to um, uh, render a fair judgment uh, in the end of the trial. So the experts that are presented and the scientific evidence that's presented at trial have to be vetted. Okay, so the defense attorneys and the prosecution are going to be looking at each other's scientific uh, experts. Okay, so you can't have kooky ideas being presented to the jury because uh, that may that might unfairly burden the prosecution or the defense, whoever's presenting the witness, because there are witnesses that are being presented by both sides. So the prosecution has to vet the witnesses of the defense and the defense has to vet the witnesses, uh, the um, the scientific experts, I should say, of the uh, of the prosecution. So both sides have to look at the scientific experts they're presenting. J uh, the voir dire process is when the scientific experts and scientific evidence is all adjudicated by both sides. So the prosecution has to call out the defense if if the prosecution thinks that they're presenting a scientific experts that's kooky or presenting ideas that are not widely accepted by the scientific community okay so those are the two main things that happen um during jury selection or during voir dire the jurors are selected that are going to sit for the trial and then the scientific experts and the scientific evidence is adjudicated and if necessary, there's going to be a fry hearing to determine the validity and the acceptability of certain scientific opinions that are going to be presented at trial. I hope that's clear, but it's important because the jurors and the scientific experts are key. Uh, the jury selection process is going to determine who's going to be listening to the trial. And the scientific experts are important because they're the ones who are going to be carrying the most of the credibility for the sides because people usually look up to doctors and scientists and other experts. So where if somebody with the right credentials says something that carries more weight, that's why scientific um, testimony is very important in a trial and it has to be accurate scientific evidence that's presented at a trial. OK. All right. So that's maybe a little bit too much details, but I want to explain things very clearly about what happens at jury selection. Um, but those are the two main things that happen at jury selection uh, during voir dire. OK, so um, I'll be making another video. This is just part one of the uh, logistical trial process, a uh, trial logistics process, I should say. And uh, I'll be making another video when we have more details on the dates, because the defense attorneys and the prosecutors are going to have to estimate exactly how long the trial is going to last. And based on that, we're going to get more logistical details later on about um, the dates on when things are going to be happening. OK, but basically uh, jury selection will be completed by November 19th and opening arguments will be made on November 29th. That's when the trial officially begins, when the defense and the prosecutors make their opening arguments about what they're going to talk about and what's going to be proven out at the end of the trial. It's like a, it's like a opening salvo in the battle between the defense and the prosecutors. OK. All right. So I'll be making another video when we get more updates on this case. But for now, that's all I got to say. Thank you so much for watching. As always, make sure to like the video, subscribe, hit the bell, press all for future videos. And if you want to support my show, you can do so on Patreon. There'll be a link in the description box and in the end of the video during the credits. With that being said, I'll see you guys all in my next video. As always, peace. If we press a case that we can't win, we just tell the next victim that she's better off staying silent. If we let Dastasio walk, we send a message to the rest of the world that in New York, the law doesn't apply to the rich and the powerful. We are here to even those scales, not cut and run.